Today, I want to share with you some of the most important things you could do to, in order for you to be able to find who is the best job applicant before you have even interviewed them. We're going to teach you exactly the step-by-step -step process we do at our companies to allow us to hire the perfect job applicants for the exact role advertised without having interviewed them yet and knowing that they actually already have the skills. One of the major challenges uh, entrepreneurs have or business owners have or any sort of a business, even if, even if you're watching this or listening to this and you're part of the HR team or the hiring team, a major challenge is how do I believe this person is telling me they have all these talents and you get jaded very quickly once you start hiring that they actually have those talents and those skills. How can I figure this out without any risk to me? How do I find out that this job applicant has all the skills necessary for the job without me risking anything, without me even having to interview them? Here's how. We're going to tell you exactly what we do and how to design your application process for any sort of a job so you know immediately if the person has the qualifications or not before you even get to the interview stage. But before I do that, in case you haven't watched any of my videos, my name is Beruz Momeni. I'm the CEO and founder at entrepreneurcorner.com. I'm joined with Genia, who is the content manager at one of my other companies, Bimo. Genia, thanks for joining me. I mean, uh, you've done a lot of hiring in the past little while. And what we're going to talk about has, I think it dramatically changed the way you're able to select people to do the job. In your case, it's mostly content writers, content creators content editors, and this can be applied to anything. It's, it's just tremendously sped up the process for you. And I'm going to get your thoughts in, in, in a minute for sure. But let's go back and see what, if you know, if you're hiring, what's the things you should actually pay attention to at a more high level? First one is, you know, we only look at three things really, but there is always a fourth element I don't talk about because it's so obvious. So I'll tell you the fourth element first, then I'm going to go and tell you the first three that are actually more important. The fourth element is, can the person do the job itself? Do they have the required skills? Do they have the bare minimum skills to do the job, right? If it's someone who is supposed to be a French to English translator, do they know French and English fluently? Like that's the bare minimum for the job, right? So that's one, that's a given. We never talk about that. But today I'm going to talk about how you could detect that before hiring uh, without having to rely on their resume, without having to rely on their degrees, none of that stuff. You're going to know immediately if they do or not before you even uh, interview them. But what's the other three? Well, the other three that we normally do talk about are what I call the big three. Intrinsic motivation, conscientiousness, and coachability. So how do you detect these, even though I call them big three, well, now you know it's big three plus one, so it's actually four things. How do you detect these? Doesn't matter what they are. In our experience, the best way to detect them is using a very old but super effective method, which is called actions speak louder than words. So your job as a hiring manager or an entrepreneur or a business owner or whatever is to put job applicants in situations where you're able to detect their behavior, not their words, so it's not their CV, it's not what they write in their emails, it's the behavior the display, and the behaviors of display can be done in two ways detected. One is you intentionally create a hiring system that tells your hiring team and your HR team to look for certain things at every stage of the application process, such as attention to detail. Guys, if this person, especially for this job, if there's no attention to detail, eliminate this applicant. This could be, hey, look, they don't have typos in their email, their application, they miss things or you put a code in your job ad and you asked what is that code they forgot they gave you the wrong code it could be you could actually design it or it could even be natural it's obvious to see if the person has attention to detail or not two they, they could look at as i mentioned to any sort of a communication between you uh, the applicant and your team emails application and if it's a fillable application we're going to give you now a sample job 
that is similar to the things you're going to do if you get the job to see if you could actually do the job before we give you the job. Obviously, depending on how in-depth this is, you have to make sure that you pay the person. If it's not that in-depth, you don't necessarily need to. For example, I know some of the major top five companies in the world, like let's say Google, Amazon, etc. depending on what technical uh, skill a job needs. Sometimes they send people without pay, two days of testing uh, for their skills, let's say developers, etc. And people normally do this for developers, but they don't do it for any other job. But you should do that for every job. We do this for every department. For our people and culture team, we have a functional test for depending on junior seniority. For sales team, we have a functional test. For marketing team, we have a functional test. For developers team, we have a functional test. For content team, we have a functional test. Every role, we have a functional test because we need to make sure that you could actually do the job and you have the skills we need. Otherwise, because that's a given, right? And people tend to lie about that just to get the job. So it is possible that a person could lie. The best way to do that is to do this and then assess them based on all your other applicants. So that's the other important thing is you give a functional test to everybody. You don't make a decision until the functional test is done unless they already displayed some weird red flags. So they apply for a job. You could even set it up so that automatically everybody gets a functional test and you instruct your team, guys, do not pay attention to anything until functional tests come in. The other advantage is now you have, let's say, 15 applicants. You have a perfect scoring system that you have developed so that everybody can be objectively scored against each other. And that way you could select, let's say, top two people. You interview them. Voila, you got to hire, hopefully. If not, you keep going down the list because it's not just about the functional tests. Remember, we talked about the big three that we're not talking about today. It's about the other characteristics. So let's talk about how to design a good functional test for every role. So Genia, you've done this for multiple content roles. That's right. First of all, advantages and how do you go about designing a good functional test for the roles you normally do? You could give your own examples, of course. Yeah, so of course, as a content manager, I deal with a lot of written content as well as social media content like videos. So really, the number one rule of designing a functional test is, as Blue's already mentioned, make them do the job. So if they're uh, coming on as a blog writer, ask them to write a blog on a specific topic, i.e. keyword. If they are becoming a video editor, ask them to edit a video with a keyword or whatever your goals are, but give them specific instructions to perform a job that they would be performing daily. So even before you know you start reviewing it, though, I would mm -hmm. also remind about a couple of things that people might not always pay attention to or think are not as important, but they still speak to attention to detail. Make sure the test is submitted on time. So if the test is not submitted on time and you know it's a day late or even you know a couple of days late, just don't look at it. Like that already shows you that the Action. person obviously didn't put enough time to be, you know, to be on time with their submission, right? And another thing I would also point out, and in my case, this is often the, the, the problem, do they actually do what you ask them to? Did they follow the instructions? So if you give them a topic to write about for the blog, did they actually write about that topic? Or is it too general? Or are they reusing some sort of other sample that they wrote previously and just submit that instead? So these are the things that, you know, you have to pay attention to as that's submitted. But really, my biggest advice for uh, creating the functional test is giving extremely detailed instructions so the person knows exactly what they need to do and uh, really basing it on what this person would do at it on a daily basis. So if they're writing on a daily basis, ask them to write something. And also, you know, not too short because you need to see a, a coherent article in front of you. Same with, with you know, with video uh, based on what they would be doing. If they're creating TikToks, ask them to create a TikTok, right? But be very specific in what you want to see. Because again, these people, you know, you don't want to assume too much because they are new. They don't know your company. You don't, they don't know your work environment. So the more detailed, the better. And then pay attention to whether they actually follow those instructions. That would be my number one advice. Even before you look at the video, was it submitted on time? Once you look at the video, is it covering the topic that you wanted? 
because if it's not, you can tell that they're not following instructions. They perhaps didn't even really read the instructions. Who knows? Yeah, that's that's the thing. The functional test continues to assess the big three, attention to detail, coachability, conscientiousness, right? Attention to detail is actually part of conscientiousness. So is organization, skill, etc. And then of course you got intrinsic motivation. So you could actually assess all of these why actions speak louder than words within a functional test because the person who is late, you're now thinking in your head, did they not read the email on time? That's not good. Did they read the instructions and forgot it? That's not good. Did they ignore it? That's even worse. Like any sort of a way you twist it, it's bad. Yes, of course, you're going to make some exceptions. We also have to say, as always, when we talk about any sort of a hiring, stick to the employment standards and laws of your jurisdiction. Obviously, that we assume you do that. So don't necessarily have to contradict what we're saying. If it's illegal in your uh, jurisdiction, don't do what we're telling you, obviously. But for the most part, now you got this thing in front of you, and it's very interesting how majority, 80%, sometimes 85, 90% of applicants get rejected right that because even if the, the actual thing is good, they do something weird somewhere else. You're like, oh, attention to detail, oh, misspelling, oh, you told them, send this and make it very detailed, like Jenny was saying that. I want this at this deadline delivered in this specific format. For example, I want a blog written that's a thousand words or less, but no less than 800 words on this specific topic delivered within two business days in a PDF. Now the minute, so this is what I would do. First, I'm like, who is send this with the word doc? Delete, delete, delete. I'm not reading anymore. It's over. You cannot pay attention to detail. I don't want to work with you because it's going to be extremely hard to try to work with you. If now this is the best of you, imagine what's going to happen once you relax and you're working with me. I don't have any tolerance for that, right? Obviously, there's going to be exceptions made, etc. Again, we're assuming everything else is okay and you've, you're also weighing this person against others, right? You're selecting somebody amongst others. Nobody is good or bad. Everybody's good. It's just who is better than everybody else because that's all you care about as a business person as a hiring manager, as an entrepreneur, whatever it is. I think those would be the main things to think about a functional test. Let's do a quick recap. One, it has to mimic the actual role and responsibility. So for example, if the person is a translator, you just give them a piece of something to translate, right? You're not gonna ask them to go drive a car. That makes no sense. Two, it has to have a specific instruction about what to do, how to do it, when to do it and when to deliver it back to you. And lastly, every single applicant must get the exact same instructions in the same exact method so that you cannot give yourself an excuse of, oh, but I said this in this email to that applicant that it's better to just automate that process, create a template that's nice, professional, obviously personalizes so the person feels that it's a personalized message but automation is actually better for the applicant as well because everybody gets treated the same. Now you wait. Once the deadline is passed, whoever passed the deadline, ignore. Everybody who sent within the deadline, now you're gonna first look at the big three, intrinsic motivation, conscientiousness, coachability. Did they listen to you? Did they have attention to detail? Did they put love and energy into this and it shows if they actually like this kind of a work or not? Once that's done, notice the last thing is actually looking at the quality of the things they, they got to do because that can be taught. Attention to detail cannot be taught. I mean, people can get better, but you, you as an entrepreneur cannot teach somebody to have attention to detail. You cannot teach them to be a coachable. You can't doubt their parents and their upbringing responsibility. You're not, you're, not, you're not babysitting, right? You just want the work done. The work itself can be taught for the most part if it's not a senior role. So that again also has exceptions. So for example, if you're hiring a chief marketing officer, no, 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 you're not gonna teach them how to be a chief marketing. They gotta be really good. So obviously, depending on seniority, the stakes keep going higher and higher and higher. In fact, for a chief marketing officer, your threshold for, or your tolerance for other issues also goes much lower. Like they gotta be even way more coachable. They gotta be way better organizer of their time. They gotta be way more intrinsically motivated for someone at that level. And that's how you fine tune it. You're going to realize that, you know, some roles you're getting lots of applicants getting through, getting to the interview stage. 
some are not, and you keep going back and forth to figure out what the good filter is. Don't get into the last piece of information I got to leave here is that don't get it trapped into perfection because nobody's perfect. Then you're going to end up with zero applicants and like two months pass and you got nothing done because you couldn't hire. You, it's better to hire someone than no one usually, unless they're like really bad and you go backwards, obviously. But normally, if you cannot hire anyone and like eight weeks have passed, you're either not getting enough applicants or you're just being too harsh on your, and you're just a perfectionist that is uh, irrelevant in this concept. No one's going to be perfect. Final thoughts, Jenny, before we wrap this up? I am a big fan of functional tests for one other reason. I think that it really erases bias, whether it's mm -hmm. uh, gender bias, ethnic racial bias, you're re literally you know, basing your selection on performance. So I am a big fan. 100%. And if you have the resources, that's, that's a very good point. For you to be able to select the absolute best, so having the big three plus the actual skill for the job, you have to strip away the name of the person. You could have a, a team member strip away the name of the person and not share their CV, et cetera, with you because that's going to be all, all the obvious. And instead, you have to have the person go through everything before you make a decision. The whole pool has to go through everything. They got to do the functional test. They got to do the phone interview. They got to do the one-on-one -on -one interview. Then you compare everybody and you have a scoring system for every step. The person who gets the highest score is the person who gets hired. If you have the resources, sometimes you don't. So you have to create a sort of a funnel where people are coming through one end of the funnel and you keep reducing it until there's one left. That is not necessarily the best, but that's a necessary thing a lot of people will have to do because they don't have the capabilities or the manpower to do otherwise. It's still, if you at least start with the functional test, it's still better than the traditional method of like, okay, I'm gonna review resumes. So think about the alternative. The alternative is which most people do, which is absolutely dumb and is doesn't get you anyone. And that's why hiring is hit and miss, is reviewing resumes and be like, okay, this resume versus this one, this one looks a lot nicer. I'm gonna hire this guy. I'm gonna talk to this guy. So you eliminated this guy just because their resume wasn't nice or whatever. Yeah, attention to detail is something, but not nice doesn't mean anything. I, in fact, most people who have the nicest resumes, I've noticed they're like the worst applicants. The people who spend the most making their resumes fancy, they're the worst applicants in the world. Yeah, and you know, additionally, I think depending on what you're hiring for, you can have a bias. Like if you're hiring for a developer's department, you might think that men are more capable, let's say right so if you if you remove those uh, identifiers by just looking at the functional test that will help out a lot not only to you know defeat bias but also to choose the person who is most suitable for the job that you are hiring them to do yeah exactly and and you know what it's almost like a half interview already and it's in action yeah. it's just so beautiful having a functional test so yeah. to wrap it up conclusion design good functional test. If you have question how to design a good functional test, let me know in the comment section. I'll get back to all of you. I'm totally sure there is not a single job in the world that I have encountered for which you cannot design a fantastic functional test. So if you're stuck, let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this, share it with a friend and of course, uh, follow and subscribe on whatever social media channel you're watching this. Thanks again for watching and we'll talk to you soon. Bye. -bye.